Welcome to the Road to Acapulco. There's a new idea in town, an idea that's been heralded by Bob Podolsky for 32 years. It's an idea that will change the world, and it's beginning to take shape in Acapulco. Welcome everyone to the fifth edition of the Road to Acapulco. This is Michael Nimitz, and I'm sitting here with Bob Podolsky. And today's topic, we're going to talk about evolution. Evolution is a word that brings up a lot of different ideas to a lot of different people. And so I thought it would be a great idea to explain in detail what Bob thinks about evolution and how it might relate to some other people's interpretation of what evolution is. So with that said, let's talk about right off the bat, Bob, what is evolution? Great question. I thank you for asking it. I'm going to approach that question from several different directions because there are several different ways, good ways, of thinking about evolution. But right at the start, I want to say that the Darwinian notion of evolution by survival of the fittest is not what I mean when I use the word evolution. That is just one occasional, maybe frequent, maybe not, but it is one mechanism for the process of evolution. It is not in and of itself evolution. Evolution is bigger, it's more general than simply survival of the fittest. So let's talk a little bit about the underpinnings of evolution. Obviously, we're talking about categories of matter. We may be talking about life, we may be not talking about life, we may be talking chemistry. Chemis chemistry uh, has its own form of evolution, it's called chemical evolution. And it relies on the fact that everything in the world has some level of awareness. For instance, take a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has enough awareness to identify other hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms, to recognize them and to combine with them to form a water molecule. The hydrogen atom itself, uh, we have a, a proton and an electron orbiting around it. Each of those has just enough awareness to find one another and interact in that way. So subatomic particles find each other and interact to form atomic particles. Atoms find each other and combine to form simple molecules. Simple molecules have more awareness than the atoms that comprise them and can combine in more ways. And so you get more complex molecules. This is chemical evolution at its most basic. Okay, so we have these processes happening. And as they continue, the complexity increases. The level of awareness of these increasingly complex components increases. The ability of these materials to find each other and interact in interesting ways increases. And this is evolution at the chemical level. And it's quite spontaneous. Nobody has to direct it. Nobody has to design it. It happens quite spontaneously. Now at a certain point, these molecules discover they can form amino acids and proteins and cells. And when you get to the cell level, the capability of what's being created is vastly more than the capabilities of the components that make up the cell. The proteins, DNA, amino acids, and so on that make up a cell do not themselves have much awareness compared to the cell. And yet a cell can be mobile, it can move, 
It can function in a variety of ways. It can find things that it wants. It can have appetite, hunger, <laughs> and it eats other things. My goodness, we're looking at life. Somehow chemistry pr provides us with life. So, Bob, if I may jump in here for a second. Please so, do. So what you're saying in regard to evolution and in regard to these particular uh, things going on, you're not presuming to say what those are. You're just making an observation that these things are occurring right? and that they're demonstrating that this process is going on. You're not saying that this is, you're not trying to say that uh, you know what the beginning of life is, that it was a single cell organism or a, a, a you know, I don't know what exactly where people proclaim that it's started. But you're just saying that the actual process demonstrates that there's evolution going on. Yes. And that evolution increases complexity. And because of that, it increases order. Now, what do I mean by order? Well, some things happen purely randomly. Some things happen through processes involving cause and effect. Cause and effect processes frequently create orderly collections of things. For instance, to, to, to go to the most basic kind of thing, <clears throat> uh, sunlight falling on the surface of a leaf is going to in some ways, sort the components that make up the leaf. And some of those components are going to interact with the sunlight and they are going to affect the growth of the leaf. The cells that make up the leaf, the leaf is like a tissue made up of some cells, uh, those cells become more aligned with each other. They have more observable relationships with each other. And you can describe the organization of the cells of a leaf uh, in a variety of uh, useful ways. The opposite process creates disorder or random chaotic behavior like Brownian motion of atoms. Brownian motion is random. If I have a box full of fast moving particles and next to it I have a box of slow-moving particles, and I open a gate between the two boxes, over time, those high-velocity particles, the hotter ones, as they say, will find their way into the colder, colder region, and some of the particles in the cold region will find their way into the hot region, until the two regions are the same temperature. They're no longer sorted, the hot and the cold particles. They've become chaotic, where before they were sorted, now they're not. And the temperature of the resulting mixture is low. It's not as low as the slow particle grouping was, but it's a lot slower than the hot particle grouping was. It's an average of sorts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that process, whereby things slow down, cool off, become disordered, is called entropy. So I like to think of evolution as the opposite of entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder, mathematically. It's a measure of the chaoticness of something, collection of particles, for example. Whereas <clears throat> the uh, orderliness manifests in greater complexity, which you can see by examination, and greater capabilities, which you can determine by observation. So we have more and more capability associated with that complexity. More awareness on the part of things being created, and so you wind up with cells combining to form tissues, tissues combining to form organs, 
Organs are way more specialized than the cells that make them up and, have, and are capable of all kinds of wonderful things that individual cells can't even dream of, let alone do. So the result is that we are constantly choosing between decisions that increase entropy and decisions that increase awareness and with it truth, love, creativity, these are directly related to that awareness level. Ah, so now we see that we, we, we are choosing between, at any moment, between things that take away from the creativity. How, what happens to a living organism when entropy sets in? Well, it dies gets sick, dies, <clears throat> deteriorates, decomposes, and then the whole thing disintegrates. And you are left with particles that are no longer alive. That's the entropy setting up. Now, one of the laws of thermodynamics is that in a closed system, that is a system that doesn't have energy coming in or going out, in a closed system, the entropy can only increase. Hmm, that sounds ominous. But it's not really, because we don't live in a closed system. The Earth is bathed in sunlight, energy coming into our system all the time in huge amounts. And for this reason, we're not stuck with only having entropy at our disposal. <laughs> We have creativity at our disposal. We have evolution at our disposal. And the thing that I particularly like about the evolutionary ethic is that by living according to the evolutionary ethic, we are aligning ourselves with evolution. We are actually saying, oh, evolution is good. I want to go in the direction of evolution. I want to increase my evolution and the evolution of those around me. And I want to be, in a sense, a spokesperson for evolution, because the opposite is entropy, chaos, death and decay. That's not what I want in my life particularly. In fact, I particularly don't want that in my life any more than necessary. Well, unless, it, unless it's government. <laughs> or lawyers, or... Uh -huh. Some of the other things that we well so much of these days. Those things are not what I would, although they couldn't exist without some evolution having happened, they do not contribute to the evolutionary process. They contribute to entropy. They are destructive, generally. There are exceptions. But generally speaking, uh, institutions that do not satisfy the evolutionary ethic, deteriorate. They die off. Empires fall. Governments fail. Eco economies collapse, and so on. If we were living in a world where everyone is at peace with each other, and everyone is striving to maximize their own creativity, then entropy, societal entropy would be diminishing, and life would be getting better and better for everyone. Why don't we do that? Well, that's pretty obvious. There are people who don't want that. There are people who want to control, monopolize, and manipulate all the resources for their own benefit. They live in a world of scarcity. They see everything is scarce, everything of value is scarce, and they want to control all of it, so that they can have as much as they want at any given time. <clears throat> These people, when they become psychopathic, become what I call the ownership class of people in the world, and they become the multi-billionaires and trillionaires who dominate most of society most of the time. Personally, I have uh, some very strong feelings of antipathy towards that group, but they don't care, and I'm just as glad at this point that they're ignoring me. 
I guess at some point they probably won't, but uh, for the time being, I'm happy to be ignored. And I'll know when things are, I'll know when I'm succeeding, when, when the octolog is succeeding, <clears throat> then we're going to start seeing jokes about it on late night television. <laughs> People making fun of it, laughing at it. This is always the next reaction. When any beautiful, brilliant, wonderful idea comes along that's new, the people who are living high off the hog on the existing paradigm, they don't like that new thing, but at first they ignore it. Then they make fun of it. Then they fight it, attempt to fight it. And when that fails, they attempt to take credit for it. This is the usual progression. Well, I, I think in this in this particular instance, everybody can benefit from yeah. the ideas of the Aqualog. Yes, ultimately, including the people that will be against it when they when the fighting starts. Yeah, if that takes place, mm -hmm. uh, it's in one it's, form or another. It's, it's, well. it's likely, though, that uh, you know, with a large portion of the population engaging in Aqualogs. Uh, the amount of knowledge and creativity they'll have at their fingertips will make it very difficult for them to utilize the, the same old control techniques. Right. Quite right. And in fact, there are fundamental features of the Octolog that make it more or less inevitable that unless all of humanity is destroyed, we will live through this crisis that we're going through, come out the other side, and create a world that most people would describe as utopian, because it'll be so much vastly better than what we have now. Now, usually the word utopian is used to mean something that is impossible. Desirable, but impossible. Oh, you believe in a utopian future. Ah. That's a put down. That person is saying, you believe in the possibility of something that's impossible. But notice, nobody knows whether something is possible or impossible until you either have a very, very well-established theory that will tell you what the outcome should be, or you run some good experiments and find out experientially what is the result of the experiment. All the experiments we've done so far with octologs have been, to some degree, not always equally so, but they are successful experiments. We know that the basics work. We know that people in a small group can make ethical decisions, unanimous decisions, fairly easily. It's not really a big deal. It's not really very hard to do with a little bit of training. We're trained many, many years in the current system, public education system especially, we are trained for things to be the way they are. So, and we, and, and we're, we are conditioned for years, you know, 12 years of, of school before you get out of high school, you've been in school for at least 12 years, and many go on to college and get more of the same kind of conditioning that tells them how things can be and how they can't be, falsely. Mostly. So, this technology aligns itself, it allows each of us to align our decision-making with the process we call evolution. Well, how do we go about that? We maximize truth, awareness, love, and creativity, and in doing so, we are aligned with evolution. It's not that complicated. It isn't rocket science. You don't have to be a genius to realize that when your life feels good and you're doing work that seems to you to be meaningful, where you, you see a recognizable improvement in the conditions of the lives of those around you as a result of what you're doing, that's an amazing experience. I spent 32 years devoted to being a physicist and doing a lot of work from which I never saw results. Yes, I saw, for example, 
that a piece of work that I did improved a radar system or improved a missile control system. Who benefited from that? <laughs> I doubt anyone did. And if they did, I certainly didn't get to see it. And yet, the moment I became a psychotherapist and began practicing, instantly I'm seeing people's lives improve. And mine improved dramatically as a result. When you are making a living, helping others improve their livings, your life changes. It's, it's an almost indescribable high to realize that here's this whole community of people now whose lives are better because of something you did. They know it, you know it, and then anyone can learn how to do things that have that effect. You don't have to be a scientist, though you could. You don't have to be a psychotherapist, though you could. You might just be an octologue organizer who teaches how to, how to, how to organize octologues or how to form holomats of octologues. Huge opportunities. Infinite flexibility. We do not need to have other people telling us what to do. We do not have to belong to organizations where we have a boss, where he takes credit for our good work and blames us for his bad mistakes. We don't need that. We can just do without that entirely. Okay, skip that. Well, actually, speaking of entropy, many of the things that our current society uh, emphasizes are essentially... Uh, symbols of, or efforts that, that create entropy within our own society. Uh, the, the school system basically increases increasing ignorance. The, you know, the, the authorities and the media kind of creating all these divisive right. uh, conflicts. Right. Uh, essentially, those are all destructive things that go on allowing them to maintain control. Right. So right. they, they can't maintain control without increasing the entropy of the system. And of course, as soon as they do that, in some ways it fundamentally becomes harder for them to control. That part's good, because being controlled takes away from evolution. Evolution is a, is, is a process that takes place spontaneously within any given context, you don't have to control it. The, the, the advantageous way of viewing it is to simply recognize it and move with it. It's like swimming with the current instead of fighting the current. In a, in a river, for example. So I like that metaphor of going with the flow. But evolution, by its very nature, increases complexity. And that in itself is kind of interesting. And I think probably we should wind up this discussion by talking a little bit about what are the milepost markers along the path of evolution. In other words, in a setting where evolution is occurring, whether it's evolution of humans, evolution of animals, evolution of machines, a topic about which we probably want to have a separate conversation, evolution of machines, uh, that process is something very worthwhile. Very worthwhile increasing complexity in an ordered way. More choices become available. Now, historically and prehistorically, uh, the human brain has evolved. One thing that happened was that the brain split into left and right sides. So you really have two brains at the, at the base, the bottom, and, and throughout your brain. You, you, there are two, two parts. And the left and right, right brains do not work exactly the same. They complement each other and they work together. They communicate with each other but they're fundamentally different. For example, when you're listening to music, 
your left brain is following the melody and if, uh, if it's a song, then your left brain is responsible for responding to the words. The right brain responds to the rhythm. The right brain is the part of the brain that appreciates the drumbeat, the rhythm that keeps the music going, the repetitive uh, quality of that is appreciated by the right brain. So you start out with a fish brain, which is extremely primitive, and then on top of the fish brain, human evolution gave us the reptile brain, which is more complex. And now you have the interaction between those two layers and the interaction between the left and the right. And so there's a lot of complexity there. And then the next stage of the evolution of the brain was the mammal brain. And the mammalian brain brought us emotions and feelings and today is responsible that part of the brain is responsible for most of our motivation and again it's left and right and finally we get the neocortex ah makes a huge difference having a neocortex because it gives us the ability to reflect on our own thinking process and that is the nature of consciousness so we went from being primitive, unconscious animal, animals to being people by acquiring a, a brain layer that lets us reflect on our own process. That self-reflection or self-awareness is the thing we call consciousness, as far as I can tell. I don't see any other way of defining consciousness that makes sense. But the interesting thing is that the cells of the brain individually do not know consciousness. They are not conscious. It is an emerging quality of the brain that cannot be localized within the brain. It is spread out throughout the whole brain. Maybe more some places than others, but the fact is the whole brain is involved in consciousness. And it is specifically something that we didn't have prior to the evolution that brought us the, the cerebral cortex. Wow. That's significant. That's an important realization. That change that happened when we went from being animals with no awareness of our awareness, or very little, to being people. Well, until we became people in that sense, we could not have any kind of morality because we couldn't reflect on our own behaviors. Now that we're able to reflect on our own behavior, morality becomes an issue. What is it? How does it come about? It's a product of evolution. We didn't have it before we had the ability to reflect on our own awareness. So that's important. It's worth knowing that awareness of our awareness brings us many capabilities, huge capabilities, that we didn't have without that. And this particular change is known as a dimensional quadrature. It is the thing that created a whole new kind of critter on this planet, a critter that is aware of being aware. And that includes humans, great apes, dolphins, whales, elephants, and probably certain species of birds, like the African gray. The African gray has a much denser brain than human. The amount of computing power, if you will, that that little brain has is, is very large for the size of the brain. The number of connections in it, very large for the size of the brain. <clears throat> now what's gonna happen as we grow our community and octologues proliferate and holomats start spreading out worldwide and overlapping with each other where you have people belonging to more than one holomat or more than one octologue. As that process continues, we're gonna see some things change in the world because what we anticipate is there is going to be a higher level of consciousness formed. 
evolution is something worth knowing as much about as you possibly can, and it pays off. And if you want to know more information, uh, there are sources of information about evolution that are really good. And uh, in fact, Michael has one in particular he wants to tell you about. Let him, let him, let's, let's do that. Well, I, what I wanted to point out was, uh, I, and I have looked over quite a bit of that book uh, by John David Garcia, uh, Creative Transformation. I, I think it talks about evolution in quite a few different aspects but i think it's a great if, for those that want to dive into what this topic could really mean uh, i think that book really explains it in a great bit of detail but what, what would you say about it i think it's a great book it is not easy reading in fact i started writing articles and books specifically because that book while very comprehensive, very relevant, is also not easy reading for most people. Uh, John David was the most brilliant person I ever met in my life, and I've met a lot of brilliant people. And he wrote uh, without holding back at all. He, 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 didn't, he didn't write, you know, many, many authors will write uh, nonfiction based on some idea they have of what is a sixth grade education, and they'll, they'll write on that level in order for the maximum number of people to understand. That wasn't John David's purpose. His purpose was for some people to understand. <laughs> and the more intelligent people are more likely to understand, and so he wrote for them. And so if you have an IQ of 100 or less, you probably shouldn't even attempt that book. But if your IQ is 125 or more, then it makes sense to read that book, to learn not only about evolution, but about what is this decision-making process that each of us faces in deciding how we're going to live our lives. He really examines that at some length. And although he goes about it differently than I would, his... his uh, Reason, you can't flaw his reasoning. His reasoning is very sound, and his knowledge of many, many relevant topics is vast, or it was before he died. He died in 2001. So yes, Creative Transformation, it's a great book. It's no longer in print, but you can get it on Amazon, or you can download it from uh, c.org, that's S-E-E dot -E org, uh, on the web. Yeah, I think I, I just looked it up and I found it somewhere on the web. I'm not sure if it was that website mm -hmm. or another. But it's it's certainly available and can be accessed via the Internet. You know, I, I wanted to point out other one other thing, and I, we just touched about it on the beginning, but this, this idea, this divisiveness, the false dichotomy, I guess, of, of the word evolution, uh, you know, the, the, the Christians or the, the believers that believe in, in creationism versus the people that believe in Darwinism. Uh, that's essentially what people think of when they hear the word evolution or what the majority of people, I suppose, hear of or hear, and then they choose one of those two sides. That, you know, being, in my opinion, a false dichotomy. Right. There are other ways of viewing it that are not encompassed by that dichotomy. And so with that, with that said, uh, you know, this, this divisive, the divisive nature that tends to be part of, I, I guess we could describe it as the entropy of our society. Yes. Uh, is, is, is a problem that for those that hear or, or when they hear the word evolution immediately fall into one of those two categories mm -hmm. they've they've kind of fallen into a, a, an area that that really is pre-selected for them a, a trap right that's a good point i like and, that and so with with that said though that that, that doesn't mean that we're we're against either one of those two those two people that fall into those two categories. We would like to 
enlighten them to another alternative. Yes, Possibly those two millions. categories oversimplifies the oversimplify the concept that evolution is really a bigger concept, more complex than either of those descriptions on their own. And while some of evolution may actually function and probably does actually function through uh, survival of the fittest, that's not by any means the only way that evolution takes place. Now. When we have, since we now have awareness of our awareness in, in acquiring uh, consciousness, we also are looking forward to the next dimensional quadrature where we might actually, as a species, we might acquire consciousness of our consciousness. Nobody knows exactly what that will look like. And because it will come about the way the brain makes consciousness based on the cells that don't know consciousness individually. They don't know cell can say, oh, I, I understand consciousness. No, you don't. The cells can't possibly. And similarly, we humans will not be able to understand the higher level of consciousness that we create in the next dimensional quadrature. But we'll know it exists because our institutions will begin consistently making ethical decisions. And we'll be able to say, aha, look, it's working. <laughs> Ethical decisions are happening. Life is getting better. And humans will thrive. Now, besides John David's book, I will recommend to people that before you read John David's book, read Flourish. Because Flourish covers all these topics at a simpler level than John David's book. It's easier to read. It's a smaller book. It's only a couple hundred pages. And you will get the fundamentals of what this whole thing is about that we're doing. And then if you feel like it, go read John David and, and, and study it in more detail, uh, more complexity, uh, bigger vocabulary, and so on. Uh, that's great. <clears throat> but learn it the easier way first. Flourish covers all the bases. And in fact, when it comes to issues having to do with uh, how people in our society see evolution, there is in that book a story that I recommend to you. It's called The Real Story of Moses and the Ten Suggestions. Ah, yes, suggestions. Why suggestions? Well, if God really was uh, part of the universe, or the creator of the universe, and if God really was omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, oh my goodness, you know, the usual classic Christian view of uh, God, <clears throat> then obviously there's something wrong going on here because either God fucked up somehow, excuse the language, screwed up, either God screwed up or uh, we, we have some things going on that we, we aren't accounting for. And the story is simply uh, a fictional piece on a conversation between God and Moses, in which God points out, God points out that much of the common beliefs of, of people about religion is, has to be false, and he explains why. He also explains that uh, an omnipotent God doesn't treat the world the way you think. No, no problem. So yes, <clears throat> uh, I do recommend you read that book and its description of evolution. Humanity has the possibility, the inherent capability of evolving into something really wonderful, collectively. The whole amount of octologues once really developed and spanning the earth so that most people belong to an octologue, as that comes about, many, many, many changes will take place that will enhance our lives. This is very predictable. This is a cause and effect kind of thing. This is not speculation. This is logic that we're talking about. 
the whole amount of archaeologues is based on 20 years of scientific research in how people interact, how they create, how they manage their organizations, how they make decisions. And we recognize through this study that most of our institutions consistently make unethical decisions. This is the big problem. This is the thing we have to change. If we are to survive as a species, we better make a change in that. Otherwise, I don't, we're going to destroy ourselves. Parasites typically destroy the host and themselves with it. And the psychopaths running the world are the parasites that I'm talking about. This could change. We can change this. It's in our power, but we have to have some basic understandings and some basic education. Look at all the years that each of you spend being educated in falsehoods. Falsehoods. Lied to. 12 years by the time you get through high school. 16 by the time you get through college. The 16 if you're, if you're lucky. Yeah, if you're lucky. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually spent longer than that going through college. But... Uh, well, actually, I wanted, I had another question pop up in my mind, and that was about, you know, you mentioned uh, hydrogen atoms, mm -hmm. having the awareness to take note of other hydrogen and oxygen atoms right. and being able to combine. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea on why hydrogen atoms act in that way? Yes, I have some ideas about that. Uh, for those who are really interested in quantum mechanics, it would make sense for me to discuss those in some detail. For people, who, the general population that doesn't have much uh, awareness of quantum mechanics, it would be a very long conversation. So, to some degree, that, that discovery is ongoing. Oh, absolutely. There are many things we don't know about even the simplest of atoms or particles. You know, uh, subatomic particles, form atomic particles. How do they do that? I don't think anyone really knows, but we do have some theories that approximate. Every scientific theory represents an approximation of reality. It's never exact. Always an approximation. And whenever you evaluate a theory, you, in order to do the job right, you have to evaluate how good an approximation is it. How far off is it? and its predictions. Uh, this is well understood within the field of science. Science only ex exists to allow us, enable us, to distinguish false information from true information. That's the sole purpose of science. And science is thus far the best tool we have for solving those questions. So there's there's still room in the in this world for God. <laughs> well, if you read the little story about Moses and the Ten Suggestions, you, you'll understand how there is room for God in the world and what that means, because that's built into the story. You know, in the storyline, uh, God is very forthcoming with Moses about what is reality and points out to him that there are a lot of people who don't like reality because they have agendas involving wealth and power that they can't get as much of if they stick to reality. And so they tell lies and they look to God for favors, so to speak. And if they can't get them from God, they'll get them from government. Government is just a control mechanism. It is a tool, a robot, that is owned and operated by the very wealthy. And uh, if you're not one of those very wealthy, you don't get to control government at all. You're out of the loop. And you're not well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, in past civilizations, the, the knowledge, knowledge class essentially used their knowledge to represent God huh. to benefit themselves. Right. And so to some degree, as we... You know, as we use science, as we understand, as we use the knowledge that we have and expertise that we have to discover what is the truth, then we can also kind of diminish the power of those who would 
who would claim to speak for God. Absolutely. And then really actually expose what God's real nature is. Yes, to the extent that we can attribute a nature to God. Yes. So to some degree, this could actually be a religious experience. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I have a friend back in Florida who read that chapter, the story of Moses and the Ten Suggestions, and he he raved about it for weeks. I mean, he, he, he would hardly talk about anything else when we get together. To me, it was just a little piece of what I had written down, but for him, it was the, the most important part. And uh, he thought that that story was exemplary in capturing the true relationship between humans and their concept of God. He really loved it. And a few other people have too. Not everyone who reads my book reads that chapter for some reason, but the ones that do seem to enjoy it. I enjoyed writing it. I had fun with it. You know, it's one of two pieces of fiction in the book and uh, worth the time, I think. All right. So I guess with that said, uh, I will wrap up our fifth episode of The Road to Acapulco. We appreciate everyone listening to us and uh, we should have some very interesting topics coming up in the near future. Uh, some of those... Uh, let me see if I can break those out, but uh, we've got a few that uh, might be of interest. Stay tuned, because mm. in the future we'll be covering things like the machine versus biological evolution. Uh, learning and understanding how to have mutual respect and convey messages with respect and receive messages with respect. Mm-hmm. The greatest invention ever. Mm. Peaceful parenting and the Octolog. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure everybody will be interested in getting started with the Octolog. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are working on uh, creating a startup kit for those that want to make Octologs. It's not finished yet, but we're working on it. And it's basically a whole set of tools for that purpose. So thank you, listeners, for being with us. Stay tuned. Keep coming back. Uh, we will have an ongoing series of these podcasts, and every one of them will address something that will increase your awareness and your ability to exemplify truth, awareness, love, and creativity. So thank you again. Have a good night. Bye-bye.